on the streets of Berlin. Some areas were now devastated beyond recognition as 33-year-old photographer William Vandervert was led to the location of the former German chancellery buildings. Just days before, these streets had been the subject of a two-week-long bloody and bitter battle between the Soviet Union's Red Army and the last of the German Wehrmacht, whose numbers had been propped up by old men and young boys recruited from the city's population. Now that the battle was over, red flags emblazoned with the hammer and sickle of the Soviet Union hung from the ruined buildings on the streets, replacing the swastika of the Third Reich, which was now no more. Vandervert later reported in Life magazine that almost every famous building in the German capital was a shambles, and that no one could walk for blocks and see any living thing, and hear nothing but the stillness of death, and smell nothing but its putrid stench. Vandervert arrived at what remained of the Reich Chancellery, and was then guided to an entrance that went down beneath it. Vandervert was about to become the first journalist from a Western Allied nation to see the Führerbunker where Adolf Hitler directed the German war effort in those final days, before he, like the Nazi dream itself, ended in blood. In the Führer's case, at his own hand in one last act of defiance. As if symbolizing the dark nature of the world he was about to step into, Vandervert later recounted that there was almost no light in the bunker, and that the Red Army guards who escorted him lit the way with candles, before the flash of his camera exposed the scenes below. His pictures gave the people of the US and beyond their first glimpse into where the Führer, perhaps the epitome of evil, had died. Since that day, the world has been fascinated with the story of Hitler's final days. Prior to 1945, it appeared as though Hitler and his fascist war machine was unstoppable as it dominated the battlefield. Even his enemies began to view him as some kind of invincible monarch. And so it was quite perplexing that the man who had enchanted audiences of thousands at the spectacular Nuremberg rallies would die in a dark hole in the ground, like a rat returning to its nest after consuming poison. This is the story of the creation of the Führer Bunker, and those hellish last days of the man who dreamed of total conquest. Welcome to Wars of the World. The origins of the bunker that would so fascinate historians after World War II can be traced back to an event that occurred barely a month after Hitler rose to power on January 30th, 1933. Up to that point, the politics of Germany in the post-Great War period were turbulent to say the least, with governments rising to power and falling soon after, while at the same time, many disillusioned and angry Germans took part in uprisings, the most famous of which was of course the so-called Beer Hall Putsch, which took place in Munich on the night of November 9th and 10th, 1923, and was carried out by Hitler himself and his followers. Thus, Hitler's assumption of power was seen as only a temporary thing, particularly as despite the popular narrative to the contrary, his support in 1933 was only barely enough to warrant President von Hindenburg appointing him as Chancellor. At the time, the seat of power in Germany was the Reichstag building, but on February 27th, 1933, the building was gutted by a fire, which was started deliberately and blamed on Dutch communist Marinus van der Lubbe. Although it is generally accepted now that he was little more than a fall guy, and that in fact it was Nazi agents who were responsible. The burning down of the Reichstag provided Hitler with the justification he needed to initiate his crackdowns on opposition groups and lead Germany towards becoming a legal dictatorship, with him as the absolute leader, the Führer. However, the fire also left them without a building within which they could conduct the business of running Deutschland. Hitler had thus taken on an office on the Wilhelmstrasse government street, which became the chancellery, but he was not impressed by its size or its lack of splendor, the Führer declaring that it was only fit for a soap company to occupy. Efforts were therefore made to expand the site to better suit the Führer's desire to impress visiting dignitaries, but also recognizing the threat from abroad as Hitler vowed to cast off the restraints of the Treaty of Versailles. The plans therefore also included an air raid shelter to protect the Führer and his staff from anticipated British or French bombing raids. 
dubbed rather simply as the Reich Chancellery Air Aid Shelter, work began in 1936, and it was situated below one of the additions made to the Chancellery. Specifically, a new, large reception hall which doubled as a ballroom. Beneath the hall was a basement, and added onto this was a hallway that descended a further one and a half meters down to the shelter. This shelter was exceptionally well protected for the period, sporting a reinforced roof 1.6 meters or 5.2 feet thick, more than double that fitted to the shelter located under the nearby Air Ministry building, where the heavy thick walls helped support the foundation of the building on top. Upon completion, the shelter had a single corridor stretching its length that connected its 12 adjacent rooms, where Hitler and his staff could continue running the country safe from an air raid. But the shelter was intended to be a temporary measure only, and not for long-term occupation. Meanwhile, above ground Hitler was still not pleased with the impression his chancellery building gave, and so directed his favourite architect, Albert Speer, to begin work on a new building altogether, on the adjacent Vossstrasse. This new Reich Chancellery was intended to do more than just give Hitler something to impress foreign visitors and to protect his sense of power. It was to be the first step in his effort to transform Berlin into the world's newest super metropolis, which would be dubbed Germania. Keeping with Hitler's insistence on monumental design, Speer would oversee the construction of a huge court of honour, the Ehrenhof, where visitors would be greeted by two statues from sculptor Arno Brecker named Wehrmacht and Partei, meaning armed forces and party, respectively. Passing through double doors measuring 17 feet high, and along a gallery 145 meters or 480 feet long, twice that of the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles, diplomats and dignitaries would reach Hitler's cavernous 400 meter squared office, suitably reassured that they were in the presence of one of the most powerful leaders on the planet. Having cast off the chains of the Treaty of Versailles, and having begun their expansion outwards with almost no military opposition, the Nazis felt almost invulnerable going into 1939. Berliners felt doubly so, for the head of the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, had promised that after Britain and France had declared war, that German fighter defences were so strong that no enemy plane could reach even the Ruhr, let alone the capital of the Third Reich. He stated that if they did, then he didn't want to be called Hermann Göring anymore, but instead Hermann Mayer, the name being seen as something of an insult. Then, on June 7th, 1940, as France was on the verge of collapse, a lone French Navy Farman NC-223 auxiliary bomber, dubbed the Jules Verne, performed a mammoth flight to Berlin to drop eight 551-pound bombs on the city's Siemens factory. What's even more amazing is that the mission was flown with almost zero opposition. While Göring didn't change his name as promised, the German leadership knew that the mission was more symbolic than a practical decision on the part of the French war effort, but it did reveal that the Reich's capital was vulnerable. As for the people of Berlin, the authorities were able to convince them that the explosions they heard were the result of industrial accidents. However, there was no covering up a visit from Britain's Royal Air Force on August 25th, 1940. The RAF raid on Berlin that night was in response to an accidental bombing of London by the Luftwaffe, although it was interpreted by the British government as an escalation of the Battle of Britain, hoping to terror bomb British civilians into demanding surrender, and thus British Prime Minister Winston Churchill felt compelled to respond in kind. The early bombing campaign against Berlin was wrought with problems for the RAF, and thus the results were rather mixed, but it was enough to alarm the German leadership that members of the High Order could be killed by British bombs while working in Berlin, including maybe even the Führer himself, something that would have a serious impact on German morale, given how Nazi society had been engineered to exist in Hitler's orbit. However, despite the public perception of Hitler's war, perpetuated by the propaganda of Joseph Goebbels, which saw the Führer leading the war effort from the capital city, from 1940 onwards, Hitler actually began to spend less and less time in Berlin. Initially, this was to tour his latest conquests, such as France and the Eiffel Tower. But as the war with Britain began to get bogged down, save for the fighting in North Africa and Greece in support of his Italian ally Mussolini, he was more concerned with the impending war in the East against the Soviet Union. As such, he increasingly spent his time in either his wartime command bunker, the so-called Wolf's Lair in the Masurian woods of East Prussia, what is now modern-day Poland, or in his holiday retreat, dubbed the Eagle's Nest, 
near the town of Berchtesgaden in southeast Germany. By 1943 though, it was clear that things were beginning to change. The fighting in North Africa, once a sideshow for Hitler, had resulted in a defeat of Rommel's Afrika Corps, and Allied troops were now pressing on to Italy itself. On the Eastern Front, the Soviet army was slowly rolling westward towards the Polish border, and in Britain, the Western Allies were gearing up to return to occupied Europe. While few in the Nazi leadership contemplated the possibility of defeat at this time, they did recognize that the war was about to get a whole lot tougher, and that even the Wolf's Lair may soon be overrun. As such, plans were drawn up for the Führer to relocate his command of the Wehrmacht to Berlin. But this was no guarantee of safety. In fact, far from it. The Allied bombing campaign had largely eliminated many of the early challenges it had faced concerning navigation and fighter protection, and the city of Berlin had by now started to come under increasingly heavy bombardment by Allied heavy bombers. Rather than have these air raids disrupt Hitler's defense, it was decided to expand the air raid shelter under the Chancellery buildings into a fully operational bunker for the Führer. This decision would see a second complex built an additional 6.5 meters deeper than the original shelter, and as if that were not enough, the reinforced roof of this bunker would be 3 meters, or 9 feet and 10 inches thick. The additional bunker featured another 30 rooms for Hitler and his staff, and was designed to be as independent as possible, featuring medical and catering facilities, as well as living quarters for Hitler and his staff. A diesel generator provided electricity, and water was provided by a well, the contents of which was pumped in, while communication systems included a telex, a telephone switchboard, and an army radio set with an outdoor antennae, which were all connected to the bunker to allow Hitler to receive information and transmit his orders. The bunker was finished remarkably quickly given the complexity of the task, and as such there was time for Hitler's quarters to be lavishly furnished and decorated. The original air raid shelter was also adapted to work with the new section, and as such it became known as the Vorbunker, meaning simply Upper Bunker, while the lower section appropriately became known as the Führer Bunker. In October 1944, the Red Army launched an offensive into East Prussia, threatening the Wolf's Lair. A month later, on Monday, November 20th, 1944, Hitler left the bunker for the last time, having spent over 800 days there over the previous three years, the most time he had spent anywhere during the war, and which had also been the site of the famous assassination attempt on July 20th, 1944. This attempt on Hitler's life saw him barely surviving the blast of a bomb, which was smuggled into the bunker by a group of German army conspirators. By now, the war had taken a damaging toll on the Führer, the man who had captivated thousands at rallies with his energy, as he promised a future of world domination based around Aryan purity, was gone. In his place was a Führer whose mental state was deteriorating from a combination of stress, the administering of a cocktail of drugs by his physicians, and one who was increasingly affected by Parkinson's disease. It was at this point that Eva Braun, his devoted mistress for nearly 16 years, rose to the challenge of keeping Hitler focused on the tasks at hand and it was she who was largely responsible for convincing Hitler in January 1945 that it was time to retreat to the Führer bunker. Hitler and Braun, along with much of his staff and their families, took up residence on January 16, 1945. Many of them knew that there was a high chance they wouldn't be leaving the bunker alive. But for the Führer, surrounded by his fine furnishings and beautiful artwork which adorned his walls, the bunker had a very different effect on his mental state, at least initially. Freed from the horrors of the outside world, his mind began to conjure up fantasies of clutching victory from the jaws of defeat. A big believer in German technical superiority, he clung to the belief that wonder weapons like the ME-262 fighter jet, the V-2 ballistic missile, and the Mao's super heavy tank would reverse Germany's fortunes. This despite the reality of the situation that the infrastructure to support such weapons was slowly being pummeled into dust by armadas of Allied bombers. By April, Soviet troops had advanced to the outskirts of Berlin, the Western Allies having agreed to let Joseph Stalin capture his ultimate prize. From the Führer bunker, Hitler was now organizing the defense of the city, including pressing into military service boys who had barely entered their teens. 
Information on the wider war effort was also becoming so scarce that to learn the latest developments, Hitler was forced to resort to tuning into broadcasts by the BBC, doing this despite it being illegal for the ordinary German citizen to do so. Hitler was last seen outside of the bunker on April 20th, 1945, for his 56th birthday. He distributed awards to those who had excelled themselves in the defense of the capital, and met with several high-ranking Nazis, such as Hermann Göring, in a rather pitiful celebration. It would be the last time for any of it. Life in the bunker offered physical safety to its residents, but psychologically, it was a torture chamber. The narrow confines of the interior meant that everywhere felt crowded and claustrophobic. The feeling was exacerbated by the lack of any natural light. There was a constant battle to pump out groundwater and wipe up moisture that built up on the walls, and while the Führer and his mistress enjoyed relative comfort, for the rest, life in the bunker was a more Spartan affair. And of course, all of this was against the backdrop of knowing that with each passing day, the Red Army was getting closer and closer. By April 1945, stories of what the Soviet troops had done to ordinary German civilians in Poland and East Germany were rife. Murder, rape, and torture had become an epidemic in the Soviet-held territories, as Soviet officers allowed their troops to indulge in their darkest desires, in revenge for what German troops had done in the Soviet Union three years prior. Faced with this reality, fear and despair gripped the population in the bunker, and many began looking for ways to ease their fears, if only for a short while. A large cache of wine in the bunker aided in this endeavor, and there were often numerous parties held there where morality was sacrificed in the pursuit of escapism. Martin Bormann, for example, Hitler's much despised private secretary, became well known for indulging in his trademark debauchery with women, hiding in the shelter from the Soviet army's rape gangs. Hitler continued to cope through a cocktail of drugs, administered by his physician, Dr. Theodor Morel, until the Führer realized in a moment of lucidity that he had become nothing more than a drug addict. He reportedly summoned Morel and went into one of his signature rages, during which he declared, quote, You have been giving me opiates the whole time. Get out of the bunker and leave me alone. End quote. Dr. Morel did leave the bunker on April 21st, 1945, taking his drugs with him. This has led some to speculate that some of Hitler's ill health reported in the last days can be attributed to him suffering from withdrawal symptoms. But not everyone found their escape through chemical or sexual means. Given the fear of what might happen to them at the hands of the Soviets, suicide became widespread amongst Berliners, and this notion had started to creep into those in the bunker, including Hitler himself. The only question was when. In the early hours of April 29th, 1945, Adolf Hitler married Eva Braun. It was a gesture to her to show his gratitude for her loyalty. The next morning, Mrs. Hitler celebrated with some of her friends amongst the bunker medical staff. During this time, Hitler was overheard speaking to SS physician Werner Hasse, where he explained that he wanted to die at the exact same time as his new wife. The plan they concocted involved both Hitler and Eva taking cyanide pills and shooting each other at the same time. Fearing that the cyanide might fail, Hitler tested a capsule on his beloved dog, Blondie. When the animal died almost instantly, it reassured the Führer of the plans for his demise. After stepping outside to see the sky for the last time, on the morning of April 30th, 1945, both Mr. and Mrs. Hitler retreated back inside as the sound rang out of the Red Army, launching another push towards the bombed-out Chancellery buildings. At 14.30 hours, after thanking many of their staff and then advising them to make a break for it, Adolf and Eva Hitler retreated to his private quarters and closed the door behind them. It was the last time they would be seen alive. After a few hours, Hitler's valet Heinz Linger and Martin Bormann entered the room and discovered their lifeless bodies. The Führer, this man who had instigated the most devastating war in history, who had visited such suffering on an industrial scale upon millions, was now dead. More suicides followed, with the most shocking being that of Joseph Goebbels and his wife Magda, who also killed their six children while in the bunker. Both the Hitlers and the Goebbels then had their bodies burned to prevent them from being used as trophies for the Red Army. Soviet troops finally captured the bunker on the morning of May 2nd, 1945, 
Normally one for displaying his successes, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin had no desire to keep the bunker intact, fearing it would become a shrine to Hitler's followers. It was therefore sealed up and the vast chancellery complex above demolished. Then later in the 1980s, East German authorities began working on an apartment block close to the bunker's location, during which it was again opened up only to then be completely destroyed in an effort to erase the stain of the bunker from the city. It wouldn't be until 2006 that the Berlin authorities actually confirmed that a nondescript parking lot now sits on the spot where Hitler killed himself. Today only a rather low-key notice board, which includes a diagram of the layout of the bunker to give an impression of its size and layout, is all that remains of it, while just a short walk away is the site of the Holocaust Memorial.